Good morning. I'm sure some of you are getting to know by now that I'm Eugene Scott, the uh, executive pastor here. It is uh, really wonderful to be a part of this congregation as I find my place in Scripture. You may have heard that there are two types of people in the world, those who believe there are two types of people in the world and those who don't. <laughs> or maybe there are two types of people in the world, those who believe in an afterlife and those who don't. We have eternity in our hearts, which is a way of saying that, that most of us believe in and yearn for some kind of afterlife, some kind of bigger purpose. As a matter of fact, that desire goes all the way back to the very beginnings as far as anthropologists can find. Some of the oldest prehistory graves that they have found, they have found in those graves tools, food, certain sacred items buried with the deceased. It's, there's no writing, so there's no way of knowing what those people believed, but it's as if they were sending their loved ones on in a journey to an afterlife. And of course, we know from prehistory into history then, there has hardly been, actually, we do not know of a culture that did not believe and seek after some kind of afterlife, believe and seek after some kind of God. We are in an endless race toward heaven. The trouble is, <clears throat> we don't know the rules very well. That there's this set of race judges and this set, and, and they all seem to have a different set of rules for running this race to the afterlife, of, of actually what it means to get there and to win the prize, as the Apostle Paul would say. I, I, I think sometimes to me it, it seems like life is one big version of that game, hotter, hotter, colder, colder. Do you ever, kids, do you remember having your parents play that with you or parents play that with, with your kids? Around Easter, or on Easter actually, we would always play that game with our little kids. We had tiny houses, so where we hid the eggs in the Easter basket was not that big of a surprise, but they still had trouble finding them. And so I would follow them around, hotter, 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 colder, colder, colder. Inevitably, the only place big enough to hide a, uh, even a small Easter basket in our houses back then was in the, the clothes dryer. And, and uh, so I would follow the kids, hotter, 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 and they'd stand in front of the clothes dryer looking around, I don't see an Easter basket, I'd finally have to open it up. After that, um, they didn't play hotter, hotter, colder, colder, the years after that, they just run straight to the clothes dryer because they knew exactly where the prize was. All religions have some kind of belief in and series of good works, a way of life one has to complete in order to get to heaven or what they call heaven. So I'm going to go through a, a brief list of some isms right here that, that illustrate this point. Atheism is a way of life that believes that there is no heaven beyond life. It's really what you make of life here because there is no God. There is no larger purpose in life, so make the most of this here and now. Buddhism is a, is a complex way that came out of, of Hinduism. It's a way of life saying, how well you perform now, nirvana, is, is reaching this place of letting go of any kind of desire. And that life is about ridding yourself of desire and, and becoming something that they call the no-self. That's Buddhism, Eugene's thumbnail sketch. Hinduism is, is even more complex as I was reading about this. And I, I found a description from someone who was trying to describe it to children. So if this sounds like it's to children, that's, that's why. I, I could kind of finally, finally get it. 
Um, Hinduism is a way of life that's, that's even more complex that, that says how well you perform your dharma, your duty, determines your karma, your fate. If you do a good job, you'll earn good karma if you have a, and have a good rebirth. If you do a bad job, you'll earn bad karma and have a bad rebirth, and this continues until you get it right. <coughs> Judeo-Christian legalism says that there is a heaven there, and there is a way of life that says if you believe precisely and do the right things precisely and keep the law precisely, you will get to heaven. Pluralism is a belief, a way of life that, that kind of takes pieces from anything and everything and, and puts it into one system. And maybe heaven for a pluralist is, is getting along and, and no strife or struggle. There's, there's a, a modern-ism, too, that, that I've just named, so you can give me credit for this if it, if it sticks, but it's called Facebook-ism. <laughs> and this is a way of life that says to be yourself and believe in yourself and pursue your passion and everything you want will come true except, except that when you're scrolling through, you compare yourself to everyone else on Facebook and wish that you were them because, and not you, because they're hiking the Inca Trail or flying around the world in 70 days, I have a friend who's doing that, uh, or eating the perfect meal while you are sitting at your desk in your cubicle drinking stale coffee and eating crackers. That's Facebookism, do you think that, that, that sticks? Yeah. Many, yeah, it does for me. Um, I'm one of those jealous types. Many people fit into the above-isms who fit in them would argue that uh, their beliefs are more nuanced and subtle than I just portrayed them. Uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, atheism, uh, legalism in a sentence is probably not fair, but this isn't a philosophy of religion class nor a comparative religion. We could discuss it deeper and, and give a more fair synopsis of, of each of those. So please don't go away insulted that I have narrowed it down to one thing. Really what I'm, I'm shooting at is, is showing us that almost every people group, almost every time in history, people have yearned for something more called nirvana or heaven or perfection here or after this life. And that those systems all ask us to do something to get there. And whether that something is accomplishable or not is the difficulty in the system. God has revealed himself to us in many different ways, and one way is in nature. And so C.S. Lewis says that there's hot and cold truth in, in each of these belief systems, that, that sometimes when we believe what they say, we're getting hotter and hotter, and sometimes it's colder and colder. And, and that's because, Lewis says, that, that what we've done is taken what we see of God in nature, and then we give it this twist because we don't quite understand. And that twist is usually, here's what you have to do to get there. And each culture and each religious system has defined what that path, that way of life is differently. For the atheist, it's ignore the yearning for something more. Explain away that, that ache in that human history where everyone has had that ache. That's a way of life. That's on me, if I'm an atheist, to get rid of that feeling, to get rid of that doubt that I came about by accident. This morning, we're digging into another abide passage, that famous, I am the way, tr the truth, and the life. I'm going to read it again for us. 
and see what Jesus has to say about this question. How do we get to the afterlife? What is the path? What is the way? Or how Thomas answers, asks it so honestly, how can we know the way? And, and do you get the sense that if we look at each of these religious systems and we multiply them, because I only picked on a couple, that the various ways to find the afterlife are so complex and so many that maybe we're like the child in the hotter, hotter, colder, colder game that just sits down and gives up. Just sits down and gives up. So follow along with me, will you? I'm going to read a little bit before the passage uh, in 14, chapter 14 begins. John 13, 36. Simon Peter asked him, Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, you, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you that I am going... What? Excuse me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you will also, you may also be where I am. You may know, you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. How can we know the way? You know, Thomas is often accused of being a doubter, but Thomas is really the, one of the more honest of the disciples. He hears what Jesus is saying, and he says, how can we know the way? And that's, that's the question we have, isn't it? If we look at, at, at what the world presents to us, how can we know the way? Is, is getting rid of all desire, as the Buddhists believe, or is living life over and over and over and over again until you perfect it, like the Hindus believe? Or which system is it? Which set of rules do we have to obey? Is it fulfilling the Ten Commandments to the letter of the law? Which set of rules is it? Thomas is asking very honestly. And, and Peter and Thomas both assume way of life leads to a place. Peter says, where are you go going? And this, this discourse that Jesus, this teaching that Jesus is doing, he's doing several teachings that is, are preparing them for his death. And they know this, and, and their, their fear level is rising. They're wondering what he's talking about. He's talking about death all the time and leaving them. Where are you going? We want to go with you. And so Peter assumes it's a place, whereas Thomas comes and asks, how can we know the way or, or the direction, the, the path of life? And I think we all ask that same question. And Jesus answers in a way that these Jewish disciples would find challenging but, but comforting. Because as we heard from Psalm 25 this morning, the phrase, the way, was really a crucial Old Testament Jewish term. Psalm 1 says, do not stand in the way of the wicked. And then it ends after some other advice. God watches over the way of the righteous. And Psalm 1 isn't the first psalm in the book of Psalms because it's the first one that was written. It's placed there first because it has the heart of Jewish theology. 
Then you can look at Genesis to Malachi, and each book of the Bible has several, if not many, references to this idea. Follow the way of the Lord. Do not follow the way of the wicked. God will light your path. Watch your steps. All of these traveling, journey, trail, way passages. The Psalms and Proverbs are, are chock full, 60, 70 references to walking in the way or watching the way. This idea of way would have, would have just rung like a bell to them. Oh, we are the group. That it, we are finally the ones, we're the disciples with the teacher that's going to teach us the correct way. How to live life so that we get wherever he's going. They would have heard that. They would have seen that. That would have rung true for them. But Jesus does something interesting here, which have you noticed with each of these, if you've been here for our abide passages, um, he takes bread and, and he takes it from this one thing that we understand and expands it to something larger and more true and real. Light, life. All of these metaphors Jesus takes, all of these things, real things in life, he takes them. And so he takes the way, and he says, you understand this. This is a manner of living. This is how you walk along. It's a movement either with God or without God. You understand that, Thomas and Peter, <laughs> Philip, Matthew. But then he tags on to there, I am the way, the truth and the life. And by so doing, he once again expands what he's talking about to something more, something just on the edge of human understanding, just to call us into this place that we'll talk about in a moment of, of dependence. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And by tacking that on, he expands our desire. Not just for a path to somewhere, but something more. Now, we in modern times have a tendency to take the Bible and divide everything up. And we think we can understand it better by dividing it all up. Um, in, in Leonardo da Vinci's days, that was called vivisection. He would take animals who were living and, and begin to operate on them to see what the, the heart did when it pumped. What he discovered in, in vivisection and taking animals apart to, to find out what made them tick is that they died. <laughs> what happens to us theologically when we divide up Scripture that way, it too dies in a way. We lose the big picture. I'm going to dive in real quickly and briefly into these words but I don't believe Jesus ever intended us to take and say, what does he mean by the way? What does he mean by the truth? What does he mean by the life? He was presenting this bigger whole picture. He was trying to give us a picture of, of a whole by using several different codependent ideas. Truth in our modern times, we understand to be, we have, we don't usually admit it, but we have a, a, a thought process that connects truth with facts. They become synonyms. If it's truthful, then it's factual. If it's factual, then it's truthful. And that limits this whole idea of truth down to, can we investigate it? Can we replicate it? Can we ask enough people to say yes, they believe it, and get a factual report. But that's not what Jesus is doing. Facts are a part of the truth, but Jesus is saying much, much more than that. It, it's broader. D.A. Carson says that, that Jesus is saying he's the supreme revelation of God. So remember, we talked about revelation that we see in, in the world Oh, God must be creative. God must be beautiful because we see cre creation and beauty. But there's, there's a deeper revelation we need to get from that place to a place of deeper truth. And Jesus is saying he is that truth. I love this phrase. I'm not so sure what Carson meant by it, 
but I, but I think I get it, I, and I love it because I'm a writer. Um, he says, uh, Jesus himself narrates God. And Jesus says this about himself in, in a couple of moments. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen God. If you've seen what I do, you've seen God. Maybe we would say that Jesus is a painting of God in a different way. So when he's saying he's the truth, he's saying this, this bigger thing that, that he is God and God's reality revealed to us. Have you ever heard someone say, that's true, true. And what they mean is real, right? They, they don't mean, oh, that's factual. They mean, yeah, that's, that's real. And I, I think that's the sense that Jesus is using more here than, than factual. He's saying that I am reality, God's revealed reality. So he's saying I am the way of life. I am God's reality. And finally, he says, I am the life. The last couple of days, my wife and I were with some friends down in Taos, New Mexico, and one of the days we went over to Ojo Caliente, which is a great hot springs resort uh, in that desert area. It has about 10 different uh, natural hot springs, a, a mud pit, which I did not get in, and, and uh, just really relaxing, calm music, people who walk around with signs saying whisper. Um, you know, so it's just, it's just really, really calm and, and beautiful. And, and, you know, sitting there in the, in the hot tub, you know, 102 degrees, and ah, this is the life. That's not what Jesus means. <laughs> That's, no, <laughs> it's not what he means. He means something bigger again. The origin, continuation, destination, and resolution or even redemption of life. So he's not saying, I am a way, a truth, a life. He's saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And all those things combine into this whole picture that we might be able to say it this way. Jesus is the way to true or real eternal life. And not simply a place we get to, but a reality that's here and now, there and then, and they're connected. And this would have surprised the disciples because them being belonging to a rabbi would have wanted to hear, yes, what do we have to do in order to get where you're going? And Jesus does not give them a list. What does he give them instead? You could probably answer this question yourself without me going on. See, what we do even today with this list is we take it on ourselves and we say, oh, this is what it means. This is, you have to believe this and you have to do this in order to be a true Christian. So I've told some of you the story when I became a Christian at camp, I thought, I better go to church. And I, I had hair down to the middle of my back. I was a hippie. And so I, I just got home from camp and ran off and found a church. I walked in, you know, listened to the sermon. There was an altar call. I went up to the altar call. I was already a Christian. I had already given my life to Christ, maybe, you know, a whole three or four days ahead of that moment. And, and I went forward and, and I, I prayed. And I was praying because I thought, oh gosh, I, I, there's still sin in me. I, there's got to be. I've got to repent some more. And so I was up repenting more, and, and one of the pastors came to me and, and said, do you want to become a Christian? He assumed, because I was dressed like a hippie and wore long hair, that I was not a Christian. And I said, no, I'm a Christian. I told him my testimony. First time I got to share my testimony. It was so exciting. And he goes, no, you're not a Christian. Because you, you can't be a Christian and have that long hair. I said, I had seen pictures of Jesus on the... <laughs> Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, zigzag rolling papers. I, that was my knowledge of Jesus until, you know, that week. And, you know, I, I thought, hey, guy, he had long hair, I, you know. And so we started arguing. And, and uh, he said, no, seriously, I have some scissors back here. I'll go cut your hair. And uh, then you can become a Christian. 
why I, as a new Christian, why I just kind of, I never went back to that church, but, but I didn't give up on church. I didn't believe that he was telling the truth. You see, what we do with this passage so often is Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then we go, oh, we get it, Jesus. The way we understand you is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you do God the way I do God, then you're in. You're in the club now, and you'll get to heaven later. Have you noticed that the Christian political argument today has that behind it too? If you, if you treat immigrants this way, you're in. If you treat immigrants this way, you're not in. If you treat um, unborn babies this way, you're in. If you treat unborn babies that way, you're out. Now, I'm not saying that those aren't crucial, heartbreaking issues that we need to wrestle with and, and that God has some way forward for us that has compassion and the cross at the heart of it. But once again, we are defining how to be in and how to get there. And what did Jesus say? He didn't say, Eugene, you're the way. He didn't say, Wellspring, you've got it. He said, I am the way. Well, what does that mean then for those of us that really struggle with how exclusive that sounds? Doesn't it sound so exclusive? Can't there be more than one way? Can't, can't there be? I mean, a lot of people would argue that. I, I really struggle with that exclusivity of, of this message. And, and part of that is that it comes out of us saying, I <laughs> And my understanding of it is the way. What if this is more open than we would ever think? So imagine that you were meeting someone for the first time and, and you found out that you had in common, you knew me. And, and this person says, oh yeah, I know Rodrigo. He's, he, he looks a, a lot like Robert Redford. He's, he's muscle-bound. He can really sing well. Well, he doesn't look so much like Robert Redford because he's better looking. And, and yeah, all of you would laugh. You would say, are we talking about the same person? And an argument ensues, right? You'd say, no, Eugene's not even six foot, not even close. He can't sing. I'm not going to touch on what I look like. You would argue that. And the other person would argue back, no, his name's Rodrigo, and he looks like this. How, how do you solve that argument? You introduce the person to me. You let me arbitrate who I am. And so throughout human history, this group and this group and this group and this group has all said, this is what God looks like and this is the way to God. And Jesus comes and says, no, I am the way. Nice to meet you. How do we know the way? You know me. And there's no way to the Father but by me. So let me ask you, is it more exclusive that you have to rid yourself of all desire to get to heaven? Or more, is it more exclusive that you have to live a perfect life, and if you don't, you have to live it over again? Is that more exclusive, more difficult? Or is it really more open for God just to come and say, You want to know how to get to heaven? You want to know how to know me? Here I am. So the focus of this is not necessarily I am the way, the truth, and the life, but I am. Once again, God has come and said, you don't need to climb to the top of a mountain and find a guru, or you don't need a list that you perfect every day. You simply come to me. You come and know me. If you were arguing about who Eugene was, the best way to solve that is say, let's go meet him. Let's go talk to him. 
You cannot give up your desires enough. You cannot sacrifice yourself enough. You cannot live the perfect life to get there. Those lists and those systems and those ways of life are not good news. They're heavy burdens that no human being has ever been able to lift, to live through to perfection. <clears throat> Jesus says to Peter, where I am going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. So he's playing word games here. He's talking about heaven, but then he's talking about the cross. The cross is the way. Jesus on the cross, sacrificing himself, himself for us, is the door. In Hebrews chapter 10, the writer writes this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place. So in, in those days, in Jesus' days, the holiest of holies had a, 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 a veil in front of it. And only certain people who had lived right could go behind there without fear and maybe even not even then and when jesus died on the cross that veil was ripped in half and the entryway into the way into the place jesus was going is wide open and the only thing we need to do is know jesus let him take us by the hand and walk us through the most holy place by the blood of jesus by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. So we can either continually put things in the coffins of those people who have gone before us, hoping that whatever we've given them is enough for the journey into heaven, or we can grasp the hand like my kids did when I was doing the hotter, hotter, colder, colder, they'd finally just get frustrated and grab me by the hand and say, Dad, show me. And that's what Jesus says. He says, I'm going to come back and show you where I'm going. I'll take you with me. All of us fit into one of those isms. More than likely, many of us fit into the Judeo-Christian legalism that we've got to live a certain way in order for God to approve of us to get us to heaven. Jesus didn't say that. He said simply, know me and I'm right here with you. I'll give you the Holy Spirit so that I'll be present with you. And, and many of us have, have felt him and known him here this morning or will after this. And what I challenge each of us to do is to repent of those isms of that push to do it right and get to heaven by our own power and simply grasp his hand and say, take me, love me, forgive me, lead me, walk with me. On Sunday mornings, it both is such a blessing and it breaks my heart to have some of you come to me with your arms crossed. And I just want to take you aside and say, what do we need to do to uncross your arms so that you can sit at the table with the rest of us? And if that's you, come and talk to us. If you believe but haven't been baptized, we've got water. <laughs> if you don't believe, let's talk about it. Let's wrestle with it. But Jesus Christ is inviting you into himself this morning. And when we go to prayer, I ask you to say, Jesus, walk with me, forgive me, take me into your arms. Let's pray together.